will we be able to upload our mind in a computer in a way where we might even transcend the constraints of our bodies? So copy our mind into a computer and leave the body behind? Let me describe one thing I've already done with my father. Yeah, it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we created technology, this is public, came out, I think, six years ago, where you could ask any question, and the, the release product, which I think is still on the market, uh, it would read 200,000 books, and then, and then find the one sentence in 200,000 books that best answered your question. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting. You can ask all kinds of questions and you get the best answer in 200,000 books. Uh, but I was also able to, to take it and uh, not go through 200,000 books, but go through a book that I put together, which is basically everything my father had written. So everything he had written, I had gathered, and we created a book, everything that Frederick Herzl had written. Now, I didn't think this actually would work that well because uh, stuff he had written was stuff about how to lay out. I mean, he did uh, directed choral groups and music groups, and he would be laying out how the people should, where they should sit and mm -hmm. and uh, how to fund this and all, all, all kinds of things that really weren't, didn't seem that interesting. Um, and yet, when you ask a question, it would go through it and it would actually give you a very good answer. So I said, well, you know, who's the most interesting composer? And he said, well, definitely Brahms. And he would go on about how Brahms was fabulous and talk about the importance of music education. And so you could have a, essentially a, uh, so question I could have and a answer, a conversation with him. Can I have a conversation with him, which was actually more interesting than talking to him, because if you talk to him, he'd be concerned about how they're going to lay out this property to give a choral group. He'd be concerned about the day-to-day -day versus the big questions. Exactly, yeah. And you did ask about the meaning of life, and he answered, love. Yeah. <laughs> do you miss him? Y yes, I do. Um, you know, you get used to missing somebody after 52 years. And I didn't really have intelligent conversations with him until later in life. Um, in the last few years, he was sick, which meant he was home a lot, and I was actually able to talk to him about different things like music and other things. And uh, so I miss that very much. What did you learn about life from your father? What, what part of him is, is with you now? He was devoted to music. And when he would create something to music, it put him in a different world. Uh, otherwise, he was very shy. Um, and if people got together, he tended not to interact with people just because of his shyness. But when he created music, that he, he was like a different person. Do you have that in you? That, yeah, that kind of yeah. light that shines? I mean, I uh, I got involved with technology at like age five. And you fell in love with it in the same way he did with music? Yeah, yeah. I remember this actually happened with my grandmother. She had a, a manual typewriter and she wrote a book, One Life Is Not Enough, which actually, good title for a book I might write, but, <laughs> and it was about a school she had created. Well, actually, her mother created it. So my mother's mother's mother created the school in 1868, and it was the first school in Europe that provided higher education for girls. It went through 14th grade. If you were a girl and you were lucky enough to get an education at all, it would go through like ninth grade. And many people didn't have any education as a girl. Uh, this went through 14th grade. Um, 
her mother created it. She took it over, and the and the book was about uh, the history of the school and her involvement with it. Um, when she presented it to me, I was not so interested in the story of the book of the school, but I was totally amazed with this manual typewriter. I mean, here was something you could put a blank piece of paper into, and you could turn it into something that looked like it came from a book. And you could actually type on it, and it looked like it came from a book. It was just amazing to me. And I could see actually how it worked. Hmm. And I was also interested in magic. Um, but in magic, if somebody actually knows how it works, the magic goes away. The magic doesn't stay there if you actually understand how it works. But he was technology. I didn't have that word when I was five or six. And the magic was still there for you? <laughs> the magic was still there, even if you knew how it worked. Yeah. So I became totally interested in this and then went around, collected little pieces of mechanical objects from bicycles, from broken radios. I would go through the neighborhood uh, this was a, an era where you would allow a five or six year olds to like roam through the neighborhood and do this. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. But, but I didn't know how to put them together. I said, if I could just figure out how to put these things together, I could solve any problem. And I actually remember talking to these very old girls, I think they were 10, um, <laughs> And t telling them, I, if I could just figure this out, I, we could fly, we could do anything. And they said, well, you, you have quite an imagination. Um, and then I, then when I was in third grade, so I was like eight, created like a virtual reality theater where people could come on stage and they could move their arms. And all of it was controlled through one control box. It was all done with mechanical technology. And it was a big hit in my third grade class. And then I went on to do things in junior high school science fairs and, and, and high school science fairs. I won the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. So, I, I mean, I became committed to technology when I was five or six years old. 